Yes, but Mohan did just say yes, it's not to be answered. How about that one? I, I was, I was just cheated. He'd have put it on it. Right, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll put, put Mohan on it. Okay. Aye, so. Looking at you. Jim Derry, Rangers Football Club. Um, just a quick interview about your uh, times as a football player and other things you get involved with in your career. Jim, how did it all start with you as a footballer? Well, it started oh, way back when I was about 13, 14, me anchor amateurs. I was uh, over the park watching them training and then they started, just they start moving into them. The story is that I became one of the, the youngest players in Scotland to ever play amateur football because uh, amateur teams at that time all had their own parts. So that kind of started to harden me up. And I left them and then I went to the Stars, the under 21s. And I was about four years with them and for your, that length of time with a, a juvenile team. You get you get up hope that you're going to be there, but believe it or not, I was a striker, right. striker, come midfield, and, uh, and then it went through there. Um, time was coming up, and then Yoker Athletic came the junior t side for me. I was only there partly a season, and um, it was at half time. It was either again Ashfield or, or Glasgow Persia. I was walking off the park. And the manager, a yoker, and the assistant manager pulled me aside and said, Did a Mr Cummings want to speak to you? And I went, all right. So spoke, jumped to the side, this guy came over and I went, I'm Mr Cummings for Rangers, don't talk to anybody. And, uh, and I'll see you at Ibrox on Tuesday. And I went, right. So I never really took that in. So I just went at half time, listened to the talk, went back out and played. That Saturday night, I went out with the girlfriend or whatever at that time. And uh, my father, who was still known at the time, had a ride back in the house. By that time I was gone, Mr. Laurie Cummins phoned back up. Can I speak to Jim? What for? He says, it's Mr. Cummings for Glasgow Rangers. Oh, what do you want him for? Because my father had a wee liquor in him at that time. And uh, he says, I forgot to ask him what school he went to. And he went, the right bloody school, so don't you worry about that. And what do you want him for? He says, it's to be at Ibrox on Tuesday. What time? He says, around about seven o'clock. Right, we'll be there for six. And that was it, took him home. And uh, Tuesday night, I uh, arrived at Ibrox. It was uh, Mr Thornton I got in, uh, introduced to first. And then in came God Waddle. Hello Jim, how are you doing? I'm fine. Right, we're interested in you. Um, I'd like to sign you. £35 a week. I'll give you 10 minutes to think about it. And off they went. So I says to my father, £35 a week? I says, but I'm making 100 the new. She says, well, I'm going to lose £65 a week. That wasn't in football, you're making 100, you're making your own job. It was, my, aye, we were, we were contracted to British Gas. No, it was a cracking job, well paid. Though there was a bit of a hokey pokey as well, you know. And are you a Ranger supporter at this point? Oh, aye, aye. The whole family was. I yeah. mean, that, that was, I mean, God. My father was never away for it, and um, so that was that. And the two are talking away, I said, I can't sign for that. Just sign, just sign, we'll worry about the money later on. So I'll come back out and he says, right, what are you doing? I says, aye, I'll, I'll, I'll just sign. Good, good, we'll call you a professional. Of course, I was ignorant to that. I said, what's he talking about a professional here? I says, I'm an amateur at junior level. And uh, he goes, you're a professional. So I never thought, I just signed. Right, you'll get to, we'll give you £250 signing one fee taxed. I think I end up with about 150 quid, 170 quid. Well, I really think that was a great deal of money. BTs, no. Eh? Nee BTs and ADs. No, <laughs> bloody nothing at all. I mean, that, that, that was waddle. Aye. And, uh, so, provisionally, that was me provisionally signed. So I played away, played away. And then, believe it or not, I got a lousy injury against a, a team. I was running after the park in the, the skin at the kneecap. Was hanging off, but I didn't know that. And the guy went, Your kneecap's hanging off, son. And I went like that, and I looked down, and I went, All right. And I looked at it, and there was about an inch and a half flap flapping away. So they took me off the park, even the referee said, Get off. And in the dress room, I don't know who the hell it was, but he poured disinfectant on the tap it and all. Bandaged it. I went up to the hospital, but by the time I go to the hospital, I'm convinced you're listening to this. You wouldn't believe this. The doctor went like that. Who did that for you? I says, oh, some guy at the, at the park. Your skin's dead. Burnt my skin. 
He says, well, we'll see it there, because this time I looked in, it was actually white. So he cleaned it out. I think it was seven or eight stitches in it. And that was me for about four, three or four weeks, trying to let this thing heal up, but it kept opening up. Every game I, I went back to playing, it just opened up. And he says, you need to stop. And then we end up having to go to Ibrox. Was this, was this a lot of pain as well? No, no, you, 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 just, you just go on with it. I can tell you what pain is. <laughs> When you really get done to get your knees replaced. Sure. Um, but uh, but that, that, that was it. So eventually get called up. The juniors were going into a, what was it, a, a kind of competition. I think it was the, the, the home counties. And it meant Rangers, that if I get called up, Rangers couldn't touch me to the, to, the, to the season. So anyway, Waddle calls me up. So I missed out my caps. And, and I went, go to the training. I had about seven or eight reserve games. First game I think I played, and you'll, you'll laugh at this, it was against Celtic. And every reserve player that they had practically became an international player. And we were driving up to Parkhead that night. What year are you talking here? Uh, probably around about 70, 71, before I played in the, in the, in the final. Yeah. And uh, drove up, and it was, got up this London road, I think it, that's what it was. And the houses were deprivated, my fair says, imagine putting people into houses like this and mm -hmm. things like that. And I said, mind we need to fill the motor up in the way back. You wouldn't believe we get beat 9 nothing. It just shows you how things change. As soon as we come out, my fair went, that's oh, the best place for the bastards. You know, <laughs> excuse my language. <laughs> it's just, I says, what we're we talking up, we'll put a gallon in it, we're giving them nothing in the trophy. And all that just changed, you know, I mean, that just shows you So, So you, you went from playing amateur? Amateur to juvenile and then to junior straight and straight in. in. And then no 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 kind of you know, stop gap it's straight at the Rangers reserves and then you're one of your first games at Celtic. First game was against Celtic. I had them six thousand at Hamden. And as I said, we had a maybe seven or eight reserve games. Is this the League Cup final? Uh Scottish Cup. Scottish Cup final. And uh, the debut. My debut. Seems incredible. No pressure. An incredible story. I mean, imagine that, you know, for, for people that are maybe a bit younger watching this, like from going from amateur, literally amateur football to your first competitive game, a cup final. Well, considering all the about seven or eight reserve games, I mean, I'm still trying to find the pace of professional football. Uh, to, and what, what, what age were you, Jim, at this point? Probably 20, 20 21, I think it was. It'd be, it'd be about that. It'd be around about 20, I, 21, I think. It was your nerves, I mean, you told your dad. I didn't have time. I'm just I'm just sitting in the dressing room. They tell me I was in the squad. Who tell you a big joke, joke walker? So nah, they just put the paper up and big joke said you're in the squad as well. And I turned up. I had to go out and buy a suit. I didn't have one. And uh, <laughs> up, up, up we went to Ibrox. Me and Neil Perry. We went to the bus for the cross up to Ibrox. We nearly were signed with Rangers at the time. It's hard, it's hard to imagine that. People that are just played, that are just signed professional for Rangers are getting the bus to the, get the bus yeah, down. I think bloody bell, I think the bus back <laughs> game, I know. <laughs> where, where, where were you staying? Uh, at that time, I was staying in the high flats at, at uh, Glenmore. Alright, okay, so, that's, that's a hell of a bus jump. Uh, tell me about it, but anyway. So up we went, on the team bus, go to Hamden, we're sitting in the dressing room, Tam Alexander, a lovely guy, I actually, my, my heart bled for him, because I... He should have been the one that played. But anyway, but before that, I'd already played four different positions for Rangers. In the reserves? In the reserves. Yeah. From striker to midfield and to centre-back. Never played full-back in any of the positions. So, in I went. Team got ready to do it. I'm a right-back. Everybody looked at me and I looked around the boot. And I looked at Tam Alexander. And I, I'm sure the, the boy must have been hurting because he must have been expecting to play. It was the first guy to stand up, shake my horn and wish me all the best. But I still, beneath my... That I felt sorry for him, that he should have been there. Out I went. Out came Jinky. Thought I did all right against him. I don't think he got the better of me. He gets switched over to the right wing against Wally Mathis, I think it was, it was left back. And out came Bobby Lennox, this flying machine. And I went, thank Christ we Doddy was to help me out. And it, what a job he did. Uh, I always loved playing with wee Doddy. Sorry, just for people that are a bit younger as well. Alec you? McDonald. And uh, on the game went, we got beat, and after the game we got the, the, the medal, 
I says to Joe Wallace and, and that says, I'd like to get a Stalic Muller, but is it possible that I could take it him and show my father first? He says, don't worry about it. Big Greg, he's gave his medal to Alec Muller. Right. Uh, Alec that, Muller that's, that's typical of Big Greg right enough, you know. Was, was Alec Muller injured? Was that the reason? He broke his jaw, I believe, right. in uh, uh, the, the other game. So uh, that was fine. He wheeled back to Ibrox and me and Neely walked up to Paisley Road at the, top of the Ibrox house. Get the bus back to Paisley, full of Rangers supporters, never. Aye. And we, and we went home. <laughs> and, and, and for somebody of my, my generation, and I'm not that young, but for the younger generation that are watching this as well, it is hard to compute in our heads that you've literally played a cup final, 106,000 fans and whatnot. You'd get back to Ibrox and then you've got the, the, the number nine probably. Aye. <laughs> number nine for Ibrox to Paisley. But aye, that was, that was it. We just walked up to the Paisley Road, go to the bus. <laughs> I went to him and it's full of easy supporters never. Did they, did they recognise you, of course? No. No, no, no. Nobody did. cameras in the days of the night. Nobody recognised me or nothing. Jim, yeah. so at that time, obviously, Willie Waddle was the manager of Rangers and Jock was the assistant, is that right? Jock, Wallace? Uh, Willie Waddle, aye, and Jock was the, the assistant, aye. How, how, how was that experience being Willie Waddle's been around for a long time? Aye, aye, aye. Yeah. 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 Ye
But we doddy, unbelievable. I always swore that if we doddy end it up getting into films and into a western movie, he wouldn't need a horse. You would call him the Duracell kid. This guy just, his wee legs just ran, ran and ran. Great wee guy to play with. So was the rest of them that came on like Bobby Russell. And I'll tell you a story about Bobby Russell. People find this hard to believe. Bobby's first game for Rangers was a reserve mid game up at Tannadice. And I still don't know why Big Joe asked me this. It's put me Bobby in front of me, I was a centre back along with Eric Morris. Eric and I thought that we'd be the two to replace Big Ronnie and Bomber in the future, but it never happened. We seemed to have a great understanding. I mean, the reserves at that time, everyone started to change. We weren't getting beat 9 in that with Celtic. We started to close the gap. Some fantastic reserve players there. And when we were away at, up, up at Tannadice, Big Joe put him in front of me and says, look after him, he's no well built. And there he was, he was built like one of the legs there. And after the game, we're up having our tea. And I found this strange. Though I was the captain of the reserves, he says, what do you think of the boy? I says, oh, there's something there. Would you get him out again? I think, I, I says, I certainly think he needs another run. Aye, definitely. I says, he's, he's got something, he does the easy thing. Aye, right. And I thought I knew it to sign him. But I found that strange that Big Joe was asking me about him. Because um, that was that. And well, you can see the, the player we Bobby came out to be. Very simple player, kept it simple. It wasn't, it wasn't physical. He came for the juniors as well, Shelton? He came, he came for the juniors, aye. Shelton came for the juniors, I wasn't too sure. Aye. And that was it, but these two 20 runs and the 40 minute increase and then that gulling sands. And you always did your warm up up the kind of putting green when you go out there. And then you went down into the flat bit and you did a couple of wee runs there and then you had to do your sit ups. Tommy McLean was my partner with the sit ups. And I say, right, Tom, I'll go first. No, 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 I'll go first. So Tom would get down. Now you had to do your sit ups. Off we went. Tom would do three and he go, anybody stopped you? <laughs> I says, Tom, you've only did three. Has anybody stopped? I says, no. Just keep going, keep going. You get to seven, has anybody stopped? I says, I have two up the top, one down at the bottom, change. Tom, hit it, sit ups. Aye. But it hang me. And then, of course, we went to the Murder Hill, and uh, you want to have seen the size of this. And the players, we made steps. That was the thing, you had to keep the steps. But even though you made the steps, the sand still moved with you. But that was the thing, you get into two teams, start at the bottom, up the top, back down to the bottom. Then you would go from the bottom to the halfway, back down to the bottom. Then you would go to halfway and then up to the top, back down to the bottom. And this went on for ages. Honestly, the legs were gone. And we had three guys for the Hong Kong Rangers that came. One would get sick and lost his teeth. You know, you could you couldn't write the script to it. It just spewed up there because with the boys turning the sand up, the teeth were lying there, so he, he lost them. The other one just collapsed. And about a thousand flies oh. just appeared from nowhere. And I went like that. Somebody went like that and said, look at that, he's trying to go to training. Steady, because Steady, you can't talk about Rangers there with the Rangers, but through, mentioned Steady and B. Henderson, they went like that, I fly cunt. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was it. On the way back, as I said, the very first time we got there, on the way back, I don't know who was holding who up, whether I was holding Doddy up or he was holding me up. But back we went with our legs wobbling all over the place. Unbelievable. That training, do you believe that helped the success of Rangers being that wee bit fitter than everyone Oh, absolutely. Else? The last 20 minutes, we were all over Sunday. Uh, yeah, they, they couldn't stay with us. I mean, the fitness level was fantastic. Something that I, 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 that I learned from watching Rangers, I started watching Rangers in the 80s as a young boy. Uh -huh. And when I look back, some of the guys that you mentioned, their careers went on, they, were, they, they, were, they didn't retire young. And I think it's because... Jock Walsh installed that mentally and physically that they were so I took the same type of training into junior management when I went, but I also added my own stuff in as well to, to, to change it. And But it, it, you're right, it kept us going. That's why I've got two knees and two hips replaced. <laughs> I ran them into the bloody ground. So when did you uh, become a first team regular? Or a, you know, Practically the, that first year when we went to Sweden, right, okay. I was part of the, the, the squad. Um, that was just a, a reward and then the, f the following year we went back to Sweden again for pre-season and I played midfield we had three games I played midfield the first year 
They placed Big Ronnie in the second line, and I played up front with Bud in the third one. And I don't think Bud and I scored that night. Every other bugger scored. But you talk, you talk about some of these players. Um, uh, for example, some some of the biggest names in Rangers football club played in that kind of era. So, how was it playing beside John Gregg? And did you believe then he would have been a future manager? We sure did. I think he quit too too early. He was wanting to change the way Rangers played under Big Joke model to playing for the back. I think he quit too early because I think he'd have been a great manager. Somewhat maybe soon as introduced it is there. More or less, aye. Aye. I think Greggy quit too early. What was the uh, views on that playing that style then? I, I think it was the right way. Because well, I mean, the management's views if they were against it. Uh, in what way would you mean? Well, if, if John Greg wanted to do that, did Wally Waddle oppose that idea? Wally Waddle wasn't there again at that time. Right, so John Chuck Wallace? J- J- uh, no, I can't even mind who was it. Was it Waddle the general manager? I, I, I couldn't mind to be honest with you, but Greggy was changing it. Greggy was the man in charge, and I saw where he was wanting to go. So, sorry, did he have a lot of influence over the play style then? Or? I would think so. I, I think you've got, uh, being a manager or a coach, you've got to have the power to play. You can't have it for you coming up the stairs and saying, no, you can't do this. That's their job. Aye, so you mean, is this when he's the manager of the club? Is it, aye, I think... Aye, so sorry, what I'm asking, so you said John Lake had this style of play. Did he then try to influence Jock Wallace to introduce that? Or? No, no, okay. no. The, 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 the big joke would have his own way. Okay. You, you, you couldn't interfere with the manager turning okay. and saying, nah, this is the way we should right. play. That's, that's they, they'd already planned that because big joke, when he became manager, had Joe Mason as his assistant. So what they said was that was it. And, you know, when people say, ah, you're a right back, I say, go and look at the film. The wingers these days, they're flying machines. And I went to Powder Hall and the, co- the sprinter, sprint coaches there put eight yards on me. Now, people don't recognise me as being one of the fastest players out, but as I said, go and have a look at the the, the winners. And, and exactly again, Arthur Duncan. And you're, you're, like, you're emphasising the fitness and the speed that there was Chuck Wallace introduced. But uh, going back to the, the John Gregg side, yeah, playing alongside him, how did it feel? Did that did that help you? He was as a, a player. Absolutely brilliant. He was a he was a great captain, and he he was going to take that and his management if he if he stayed with it. Yeah. But. And I'll, I'll tell you how good a captain he was. He always looked after you, even after part, because I remember one incident in particular. I get to a nasty gash injury, a nasty shin injury, uh, out at the Albion, I hobbled back. And the physio, I'm not going to mention his name, but I called him Dr. Bruffin. It was, when you get injured, you get two Bruffin tail to run it off. So I nicknamed him Dr. Bruffin. But anyway, we're in the first aid room, and he says, the doctor's not here. I'll have a shot at it. Now, anybody gets stitched up in the shin, they'll know the skin's as tight as hell there. Big Derek Johnson's in the dress room, in the physio room, bouncing the ball. So, the physio, you don't get injected, you just clean it up, and he puts a needle through and pulls it through, cuts it, does the same, and puts six stitches through with the string, the, the thread all hanging there. And then he pulls it up like a shoelace to try and tie it, and Big Derek hits him the shooter with the ball and out it comes. Then he tied, he tied the other two, couple too tight and too slack, but Big Greg, he stuck his head through the, the, the medical room and had a look. And he saw my face and went upstairs and Big Wallace was doing within a couple of minutes. What's going on? He said, I just thought I'd have a shot, try and stitch Jim up. Get the doctor. Doctor arrived within 10 minutes. Looked at it. And I went, Doc, I hope you're going to inject this and freeze it. Yeah, we'll get some done. He said, Jake, you can find the same holes Tam made. They might not be there. And that was it. Six stitches. And that was the way it was. But to be perfectly honest with you, Big Joke was a better medic than any of them. Aye. He'd lie, you'd lie on the table with an injury. He'd walk right up, took one look at you. He a man and a poof. <laughs> that was enough to get you off that table and get out. Right. But see if you didn't get up, the stick you would have taken, especially after Steenie and all that. Because Steenie had a great saying, he'd put his head through the door, you know, tight stone, and that'd be it. You know, that was Steenie, right. you know. So you've you've said a couple of times about right back, and then you said that you played in, you know, up front and then midfield as well. And centre the, back. And centre back. So the majority, of, the majority of time, was it right back you played for Rangers? 
I don't know, I'd question that. In the reserves, I was always... I played a couple of seasons, I think, up front at the, the reserve side. And I, two figures come into my mind, 24 and 25. Well, that was the amount of goals I scored. I, I could be wrong. I wouldn't quote me on that, because going back all the time, uh, your, your mind is not as, uh, as sharp. But most of the time, I'd be centre-back along with Eric Morris. And Eric told me, I'm going back a few years back, when I, when I met him, that we set a record at Ibrox. 65 reserve games and we only lost 18 goals. Now, that was the duty, Eric and I, alone. That was the duty of the reserve side with Jerry Neefen goals or Ronnie Lowry or Donald Hunter or Bobby Watson. The whole of the, that reserve side, we just turned it round against Celtic. And you can see with a couple of the wee shields that I've got there. Yeah. That's what I've done. Sure. And, you know, people talk about the, the fitness level and, and things like that and the traditional Rangers. As soon as I sign trophy room, this is what we look for. We want to expand this, we want to make this bigger. Right, and this is what you're going to get in the reserves. Six pounds for a win. Nothing for a draw. And obviously nothing for a defeat. You want an extra six quid? You had to win your game. That is what they were instilling into you. And it was the same when you the first team. You wanted to make a good wage? Win the game and get your bonus. Because the wages weren't that great. You had to make it up with a, a bonus. It's changed now. Because when you look at players now, that, God, God knows what some players are getting. Oh, they a bonus, does it? Aye, ah, they're making a great living. They don't even need to kick the ball. Jim, yeah, um, when I spoke to you before, I've obviously met you a few times, when I spoke to you regarding doing an interview, you described yourself as very much a fringe player. Yeah, For right. Rangers, um, and I hope you don't mind me calling you that. Um, the reason I'm asking that is you did show us a few f photographs before we done the interview. How many positions did you actually play for Rangers? Eleven. Could you care to elaborate on how that could the be? The only one, let's get the question mark on it, is the goalkeeper. That was a reserve game one night against uh, Partick Thistle. Don't ask me what happened that night, but they goalies turned up, big joke. He said, you ever playing goals before? I went, <laughs> aye. Right, there's a jersey, get it on. We drew one each, and then we got them in the replay at Ibrox and beat them 6 nothing. I can always remember that, but played right back, left back, centre back, and all that, right through the whole team. Was that, don't mind me asking, was there any particular route where you kind of, obviously you, you sound pretty versatile, but can you just not find your right position, or did the manager just use you for any position you could? It happened to, uh, that, that actually came about on my second contract, I think it was, and uh, up you went, and there's Big joke, sitting to the right of the table, and Dido sitting there with his white shirt and the glasses. Sit down, Jim. Right, we've got good news and bad news for you. What would you like first? I mean, we're always better with the bad news so you can be cushioned with the good news. He says, right, uh, you're not going to get a regular game here. And I went, and why no? He says, we've discovered a player that can play in any position without upsetting the rhythm of the team. And that's how we're going to use you. Who was that? Waddle. Big joke just said. No, was it? Sorry, the player. Me. This was me. <laughs> you're only in the dressing room. You're only in the room with they two. Right, aye. He says, that's how we're going to use you. And I says, but surely, that if I'm playing well, I deserve a run the team. He says, that'll be decided at the time and on merit. He says, but that's how we're going to use you. He says, well, there's no another player in Britain, if not Europe, that could do what you can do. And I went, all right. I says, well, what's the good news? There's a two-year contract. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Off I went, and that was how I was used. I just player get injured, I was in. Player come back, I was out. And that's the way it went. And just to explain to some of the younger viewers that are watching, Jim, there would have been no football agents in these, those days. No football agents at all. Just you? You were there talking talk with Waddle. Take it or leave it? Take it or leave it. That, that, that was and it. If, I, if, you're, if you get a chance to sign for a, a club and renew your contract with a team full of your heroes and legends, then you don't really say no, do it you? It was a privilege. Yeah. It was an absolute privilege to put the blue jersey on and play with these guys. I mean, that, that was it. And Rangers were the only team that were interested in me. Even the other one at the other side of the city was interested. But Laurie Cummins 
come in at half time, which was illegal. That's why I was telling to keep my trap shut. And that's why he came in dead quick, got his sentence again, cleared out. That was an illegal move because I had Spurs, Chelsea, Queen's Park, I'm trying to think, there, there was about three or four in doing England were also interested, and quite a few up here. But Laurie Collins uh, came in at half time, which was an illegal move. And the two guys that were in charge of Yoker at the time, I think they get jobs at Ibrox as scouts. I'm sure they did. Yeah. I could be wrong, don't quote me on it. So, we'll talk in a wee minute's time about your, one of your, ha your highlights here. Your career would have been, been part of the, the 72 final and Rangers winning the Cup Winners Cup. Oh, absolutely. But before I do that, and, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss this here, we were doing the GRS TV, we always talk about reality and how things were. Things weren't always rosy. And um, being a fringe player, at one point you were a, a, a target for the Boo Boys. Yeah. For a bit later. Well, how did that come about and what was your reaction to it? That, that came about that uh, Waddle asked me to sign another contract. He offered me a tenner and I refused. A tenner extra? A, ten, a ten pound extra on my wages and I refused. So he went, you sign? I went, no. I said, I'm not signing if that's all you're giving me. He says, uh, you want a transfer then? And I went, if that's the only way I'm going to get more money, I might need to think about it. Well, you're not getting away and I don't consider it unless it's in writing. So I went home that day, and it went through my mind. Never slept that night at all. Did you speak to your dad? Never spoke to my father, no, no. Because I was thinking, he, he would have just told you to get a sign. Oh, he would, say, oh, he would, he would have hesitated, just saying, I'll give you a ten or something like that. <laughs> but anyway, so, so anyway, I never slept that night. And I went, he's called my bluff. And that's, what, that's the way I thought, he's called my bluff. So I wrote a letter and went, oh, the next day. And a lot of people running about the stadium knew that I was going up the stairs with this letter. So off I went, I says, that's a, the letter, boss. Right, OK. That was that. How are you feeling at this point? Nervous. Very nervous. But out I went, did my training. Never thought anything about it. I says, oh, maybe we got a tenner next week. Anyway, him that night. The phone went at the back of four, five o'clock-ish. Excuse my language. The fuck are you doing going to the papers? And I looked at the phone and I went, what? the fuck are you doing going to the papers? I've had the papers on to me. I says, I've not spoke to anybody, boss. I says, it's only between me and you. Well, fucking papers have been on to me. I'll see you in the morning. Poof, phone deed. How'd that make you feel? <laughs> how'd, how'd it feel? I don't think I ate that night. Didn't even sleep. So, I mean, at this point, you, you mentioned the earlier on, sorry for interrupting, but you mentioned to us earlier on, at this, at this point, you rated him as one of the biggest influences in Scottish football. Sorry? You, you, uh, earlier on you were telling us that when that happened to you, that you at, the po at that point, Wally Waddle and your view was one of the biggest characters. Well, he's a powerful man. In Scottish po football. Powerful, powerful man. People didn't realise how powerful this guy did. Nothing in Scottish football moved unless he said so. And backed up with Steen, Turnbull, Bonthrone and Jim McLean. They, they were your big guns. But they did them. Powerful, powerful man. That's why we call them God. And up to see him the next day, yeah, what the fuck are you doing? I said, boss, I never went to the papers. I know he did. He says, you don't really want to win. I says, no. He says, you sign? And I went, no. Well, off you go, you're doing the training. I don't want to hear any more about it. That was it, closed. End of story. Nothing said. Who went to the tunnel that Saturday? Warming up. There's a couple of guys up, the, up above us, chatting away. I'm warming up, having a wee bitten back then and then these two I don't want to call them too much but anyway looked to her looked to her again and I went Denny you're nothing but a fucking traitor nobody asks away for Rangers Football Club and one spat at me then two of the other ones started up as well I decided exit stays right here get myself out of the tunnel out I went come on to the park I could hear a couple of boos, week in, week out, the boos get mere and mere, and then it became a hardcore. They never forgave me for that. Never. And this is all for the sake of tenor. tenor. It seems incredible. For somebody that I've grown up watching guys like Low Drop and Gaza singing for Rangers, etc., for the sake of £10 a week, and it's not your fault, I, I blame... £10 was a lot in your day. Uh, 
I was going to ask uh, if you remember comparatively for the the, the, the time, how, how much was it? It was, yeah, I, would, I would say it was medium, if you like. Maybe you know even that. Because you're, you're, you're only on, you went from having £100 a week yeah. to £35. And right. for a guy that's played in the, the, the Cup Winners Cup and whatever, and played semi-regularly for Rangers, uh-huh. and fills in every position, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for an extra £10 a week. Neither did I, but Waddle thought it was putting his end pocket <laughs> tight. You're lucky he's not a financial financial advisor for Scotland. <laughs> we thought we were living in prefabs or something like that. So, so again, just, at this point, you, you, as we, we spoke about, you did say that you were a French player, so that meant that you were only, only playing as regularly to prove the fans wrong. No. How did you cope? Because it's clear, from the events I've ran, you've, you've came along to many of them and spoke to me, and you've got a massive love for Rangers, you've never held a grudge about it, but how was it as a, a young player coping with hearing the fans? Pe- people say it shouldn't affect you, but it does. Because you're not only thinking about Am I playing well? You, st- you start to get frightened to do things. Yeah. That's what happens. You, you do start to get frightened to try things or the bone your case. But you're not only thinking of yourself. You've got your family to think about. Your brother, your family. Understands. What is people saying to them out the back? Oh, your brother's a shite bag or, or something like that. He's hopeless and all that. But they never forgive your Rangers fans. Not like nowadays. You can get them going. They wouldn't think anything about it. You'd be a hero. But... Mm. In the 80s. Well, Gordon just took two man your cups of tea and he's never forgave you. No, absolutely. <laughs> well, at least he's left me a biscuit anyway, you know what I mean? So, so that was it, the kind of lower point, obviously, you had, you had to get over, you had, you had to keep playing. You well, as I always say to these people, bloody ask yourself one question. Why was I still there four years after? Well, that's I was what still I there. ask you, what, what stage in your career was this? What, what year was this? I think it was about the fifth year in. And that would be about be 35 pr- or so? 35 something like that, round about that. It would be round about that. But the thing is, that was the last time I ever mentioned it. Yeah. And then it, 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 it raised its head again sometime in the, in, in the future. And Big Joe, I've got it there, I don't know if it's in that bit of it, but I've got it there with Big Joe Wallace. Jim Denny didn't ask for a transfer. And Jim Denny's no for sale. And, you know, trying to get back there and think of all these things that did happen. Uh, you know, because I always remember uh, in one game I get money in the match, but it wouldn't make any difference. You were still booed. And I, there was even one game against Partick, and I, believe it or not, I actually lifted my haunted belt, a supporter going up the tunnel, and there was a postman that stopped me. I get injured. I went for a tackle, it was ne- never mind, I get injured. And I'm in the, in the middle of the centre circle with this injury. The ball was in their box. One of their players tried to dribble out and lost it, and Partick scored. I'm coming after the game. I get blamed for it. That's how bad it went. So did you, in your own mind, think you had to play harder or try things you, you, you shouldn't be trying to try and win over the fans again? Or, or it, it wouldn't matter what I, what I tried. It, uh, you, you, could, you could have been man of the match or you could play well. And they got to the stage, and I remember one night, it was against a European team. The, they were hitting up towards the Copeland then, and... The boy threw the, the boy to this winger's that the day, feet. The day I think it was I. I think it was. Uh, I think it, I can't remember if it was Zurich or no. But the boy, when it came to his feet, he just kicked it over his head and turned. You know, this boy was, was quick, but I get back and made a good tackle on him. But when you heard the fans clapping, I actually thought they were clapping for his skill, no for my tackle. That's how it affected you. And I remember a comment made by a sporting Lisbon manager years ago. Coaches don't destroy players, fans do. They go on their back, it doesn't matter how well he plays, they're never off his back, and the player is, becomes frightened to try things out, and you lose them. So, I just, just want to get away for this for a second, a bit. Yeah, I, sure. I want to ask you a question, just, just out of curiosity. I know for a fact that you, you follow Rangers on a regular basis. You're, you're, uh-huh. you're, you're a massive Rangers fan. Um, do you ever find yourself in a scenario where you're shouting at a player and then feeling guilty then? Say, say that again? As a fan, do you ever shout at a player and then think back to yourself? No, I don't. Or does that it's, it's, it's too easy to criticise players. Every player makes a mistake. It doesn't matter who he is. He makes a mistake. It's how you react after the mistake. But I always say that some players have gone to that player's back and I always say to myself, what happens when you make the next mistake? Are you going to take the same abuse you gave him? Probably no. 
So if a player makes a mistake, and this is where I, I, I love watching the Europeans, see when one of them makes a mistake, how often do you see a player that, and that their team get known to them? Very rarely. No, the, the game's changed. The other day, oh, you had to win. I mean, we had some crabbit buggers, you know what I mean? And you've got to be honest when you make a mistake. And there was an incident, I'll get back to it, and it was Sandy Jardin and I was involved. I was centre back that night against Queen's Park, and a long ball got played through. And the, the guy was in between me and Sandy. I was on the inside, Sandy was outside, and he was closing down the goals, and he took the shot and scored. We came in at half time. Big joke had he say, he was angry because we were getting beat one night this time. And then he turned on me, and of course, stupid bloody me answered back because I was just back in the first team. I went, oh, that's great, just back in the team, and I'm getting blamed for the goal. But four or five of the players rounded on me, quite correctly. And uh, I was that angry at myself losing this bloody goal. Mm -hmm. Then we came back out, I approached Sandy, and I said, Sandy, I owe you an apology. It was my mistake. I should have made the tackle. I was the inside. But at least I put my horn up and admitted to the mistake. Yeah. And that's what I always think then, that if you make a mistake, the last thing you need is people own your case. It's how you react to it. And I always say that with my grandkids. If you make a mistake, how do you react to that mistake? Go and try and rectify it. But don't try too hard in case you make another one. And, you know, to... The, the players were doing. I mean, you, you couldn't ask for any more. So, so just to, 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 to go to happier times anyway, um, I didn't think he was good. To, well, I, I, could good give, to I could give you some good laughs in the park. And anyway, I think he was important that we did go into that wee park because your name gets people... Oh, absolutely. Name. I mean, they, they say I was crap and things like that. That's their opinion. I even remember a guy saying that uh, his father told me I was crap. I said, did you see me yourself? He went, no. Oh, sure. I said, so you're taking somebody else's word. So if you're yeah. fair... Tell you the world was square, you wouldn't believe him. Aye. That, that, that was the point. That's you know? the problem you've got. So, however, uh, Barcelona, 72, Rangers win the European Cup Winners' Cup, and the, it's the only time we've won a European trophy in my illustrious 150 year history. Uh -huh. um, just tell us about that season. I know you didn't fe feature in the main game, however, you were part of the squad in that season. Yeah, well, I, I was a I think, I caught the bud there anyway. I was a sub in every game, right? So, that that, that covered them up. I go in against Stade Rennes and the uh, second leg and I get booked the guy said it was offside but I wasn't he? but anyway I still missed the target that's probably the same point but, uh, but as we went through stage by stage and I need to tell you this th th this is actually quite funny um, we Wally Henderson at that time was more or less in his way out which was, which was a shame because he was one of the characters in the dressing room he did not answer back him and Steen he stayed away for the two but anyway, Steeny tried a trick at the sidelines, right next to the dugout and fell out of the ball in the track. And that's all we really needed. He leaned out the dugout and he went, Steeny says, that's the best move you've made all night. <laughs> I mean, that was it. Steeny looked back at him. And as I always say to Steeny, if you weren't too busy concentrating the game, you'd probably answer it back, aye, but it's one move more than you're making. That, that was why they two were, you know. And uh, it went on. And then he came up against Bayern Munich, Derek Palmer, what a goal he scored on Sandy. And I'm sure Derek scored with his left foot that night, and he wasn't really a left footer, but what a game he had. And that took us into the final. We took our partners, our women, we were women, we were in Barcelona. Can, and, can, uh, I saw, can I just go sure, back? Yeah. Uh, Sport in Lisbon was a famous game because Rangers thought they were out of we were the, thought it, the Cup Winners' Cup. And we, Willie Henderson, made a comment that night as well that, that we goals counted double but also had a porter come in and said the same thing so we ended up going through but the referee had lost but it went to penalties it went to penalties big day mm -hmm. I think Dave Smith missed two that night so Rangers lost it on penalties and then you get told that you guys told won the game we're through <laughs> and, and I, this day and age that, for me like that, that that's incredible to think what, what was, oh, it, what was, was, it, what was the chat it was, was it just one player as you're saying or did anybody else think we were through well, no I think I think everybody thought we were out and then this reporter came up me Wally had mentioned it that goals counted it double is that the uh, first season that that role came in? I think it, it might have been. I, I, I wasn't sure. But the disappointing thing that night was Big Ronnie's leg getting broken. Mm. And how that guy stayed in the park, I mean, you wouldn't have heard it. But Can't imagine. it was just the way Ronnie went in. His leg was left open, the boy just threw it out of the tap and snapped it. I went up to see Ronnie in the hospital after it. And he was in this wee grubby bedroom. And then, of course, we got him and they played the next day. Ronnie was, that was it for Ronnie. His career was going. It was a lousy break. 
And uh, but did they not play in the final? No, no, Ronnie didn't play in either. Big big bomber. He was fit right up to the final. Done his selling training. So it ended up Derek Johnson and Dave Smith. I think it was at the back. Sandy, right Dave, back. Dave Smith was man of the match. Dave Smith, aye. Oh, what what a player he was. He he was great to play with. Um, he, he used to play in the reserves and say, let the boy nutmeg you and I'll get it on the other side and vice versa. We used to do that. And the only manager that ever caught us out at that was Jim McLean. Right. And it was a reserve game at Dundee United, uh, at uh, Ibrox. We were letting the strikers put the ball through and of course they'd go nutmeg and all that. But Davy or I would be sitting at, at the back of the other one. As soon as they played it through, we just played it forward. Mm. And we were counter-attacking. And it wasn't the second half. I always remember Jim McLean. Many different times have I got to tell you that. Don't do that with these two, they're waiting on you. And that was the way it was. So, um, so tell us about the build-up then, Terry, at the final then. Did no, you we, we ended up... You weren't expecting to play the match? No, I wasn't expecting my sub to be perfectly honest with you. Um, well, I, I don't know, probably did consider him as a sub in every other game. But um, we got there, the women got carted after one hotel and we went to another. And my roommate was Andy Penman. What a gorgeous player he was, striker of the ball. Unbelievable. And... Uh, they, get, they mentioned who they were, all that, out they went, and then the boys see up. And after the game, the fans were growing apart, and the police were chasing them off, and honestly, the police, the police were brutal. But the fans had thought the referee had blood for time, it was a foul. Well, and after they went, and this went back, then they decided that they could not uh, give the cup to Greggy outside. It was too hectic. So he, him and Waddle had to go to some director's room and pick up the cup and the medals. He came back and uh, I think my Greg gave the medals to the physio to hand out and that was it. Nobody, the fans never saw the, the, the cup getting given to the And I believe you never, yeah. even be, be, being on the bench, you never got a medal? I never got a medal, no. Never you get a bloody bonus either. We got a <laughs> couple hundred quid. But talking about the bonus, um, people might have heard this before. We bud went up to speak to Waddle about the bonus. And the deed of shrewd as he is, when like, how much are you looking for? Wee bud says, uh, about two grand. And Waddle replied, what between you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was Waddle. I mean, sharp as you like, that no matter what you thought about the guy. And Bud now went each. Right, I'll think about it. So off Bud went. I'm assuming the Waddle sees you getting it, you get it. There's no other. Well, there's no, there's no getting it. He wouldn't go back in his word, Waddle. That's one of the things is. No, I mean the board wouldn't be able to say anything else. No, I don't think so. Decided. So anyway, after we won it, Bud went back. Now Bud would tell you the story different. I'm just telling you what I, 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 me Bud was telling me. The way he, he would explain it probably better. So Bud went back to see him. What you want? Uh, see about the bonus. All right. £2,000 you asked for. All right. You agreeing that then? All right. You sure? All right. That's all right then, because I was thinking giving you three. I didn't put it away, dude. And that, that was it. Um, I assume the deal would have been if they never won it, they would have got nothing. We, we don't have it in, no. You it's don't get it. That was anyway. one thing about Rangers. You don't win the game. It doesn't matter when you're in Europe. You get nothing. You had to get, you had to win your game. And that that was the way it was. But as I said, I mean, you, you had your characters at Ibrox. You, you needed them. You, you couldn't talk about your career at Rangers without talking about oh, Steenie and Henderson they, they were the worst two as I said if you answered them back they'd be in your case all week and I always remember playing up front with Colin Steen actually and it was against Partick I could never mind who the referee was We Bobby Hope he comes to my mind but I, I could be wrong in that and I get filled and Partick's box it was a penalty they have not getting away from it play on Steenie that's a penalty, you pillock. That was, that's what he says to the referee, but the ball went for a throw-in. Steenie was... We were, both of us were in the vicinity of the referee at the time. Steenie went like that. Hold you. Excuse the language. You're having a fucking nightmare. And the referee just took me and looked at him. Well, let's see how many stars you'll get in the mail tomorrow. That was <laughs> it. You wouldn't get that now. And that's going to fact that just, going. Steenie just looked through like that, you know, but that's the way Steenie was. But uh, even we were early Albion, we used to train over there. And uh, we had a young trialist one day, and he was walking in back with me and Steenie. And he says to me, he says, is there any advice you can give me, Jim, that I could maybe a big joke would sign me? I says, just keep working hard, son. I says, he likes that. If you're working hard, you'll, you'll maybe do something. 
Then he made a mistake, didn't he? he turned around to Steenie. Is there any advice you can give me, Colin? Aye, hang your boots up. <laughs> so, how, how long did you spend at Wingers in total? Eh, uh, eight and a half, nine years. 70, 71 I signed, 78, 79 I left. Um, Rangers sold me hearts. Um, and that was that. Disappointing, I was... John Gregg played me against Cologne. This was my first game, I think, in the first team that year. And... Uh, he says, you've got a... But he brought me, brought me out of his office and he says, I'll bring you into the squad. And I went, oh, I've got a gut feeling and uh, that you were going to do that. Well, that's fine. He says, right. He says, get down the stairs, you're, you're getting your photos taken. But of course, I'm already, but I don't want to say what else happened. But anyway, they gave us the jersey put on. I had a shirt and tie on. And of course, the tie and the shirt collar was above the jersey. So you're sending Cologne these pictures. And uh, back they came, big Ray came into the dressing room, right? The lot you saw sitting down, the was fuming. Look at this fucking photo, look at that, look at that, Pelly. And we all looked to her, and there's, there's me standing there with a sharp tie. He says, What are they going to think when they see that picture? I says, Well, if that was their manager, I'd be shining myself. He'll think, Well, that good, we've just got to keep our suits on. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. So there we went. He says, right, I've got an important job. Took me up his, his room, he says, I'm going to play you. I said, I've got feeling. You always do get that gut feeling. He says, but it worries me that, that I've not played you and the part's heavy and things like that. I said, I'll not let you do. He says, you're going to Mark Labarski. He does the score. <laughs> he was one of the, I don't he's been one of the best players in the world. Oh, absolutely. If I remember. Pierre Labarski. Aye, he goes like that, he says, uh, he's in midfield. You make sure you mark him. Right, okay. So that was me, in the midfield. Labarski goes to the side right against Sally Dawson. And the other goes like that, Jim, you have to mark Labarski, you better come out here. I says, stay with you. I says, I'm back where I should be. I says, if I stop him, the supplier will stop Labarski and I'll be there to help you. Well, I thought Ali and I did well against the two that night. And of course, they broke through right away quickly within the first 15, 20 seconds. And I saw the space where he was going to cut it back and I went in, but I moved too quick. But it got cut back behind me a wee bit, but I managed to get it in my right foot. Sliced it right out for a corner. And I could think of it in my mind, I could see Big Ray going, I've played the right man. <laughs> but anyway, we settled into a game because the next three boys that sliced the ball was Newman and wee boy Russell. We all sliced the ball and I said, they're all settling in now. And uh, I thought I played well that night. And I lost it, but 70 odd minutes, I'm starting to take cramp, but it wasn't really the cramp that done me. Derek Parling came rushing into the box to defend, slid in, and his knee caught me right in the thigh, so that didn't help anyway. And uh, and it was a shitty goal that night. This ball went back for it like a pinball, and he scored with it. It wasn't as if it was well worked out, it just bounced off for two or three years, and it ended up in the, in the net. We could beat one nine, which we thought was a great result. And I watched Big Greg in the dressing room that night. He's telling everybody to calm down. I've never seen a guy pay something down. I don't think he even let a cigar. I think he was starting to eat it. Telling everybody to calm down because it was a great result because they were some team. Aye. And uh, of course it went back to Ibrox. He didn't play me the second leg and uh, we get beat 2-1 or something, I think it was. And, and, and that was it. But um, but I, I just thought being a manager he quit too early because I thought he would know greater things. So... so I'm going to change it a wee bit, the, the, the topic a wee bit, Jim. Uh, sure. Um, one, one of the kind of things I was thinking before I'd done this interview is, after hearing some stories about you, that in many ways, regarding your football career, there was two Jim Dennys. The reason I'm saying that, when you talk about the Cologne game you told me earlier on, that made you, during the game, start thinking about football in a different manner from what traditionally people just thought is, get to run and get off the park. Uh -huh. You started to analyse the game, and that yeah. gave you a different... Outlook and a different kind of path in football, yeah, is that right? Yeah, Well, what, what I did was uh, I just felt football was changing. And to be perfectly honest with you, I criticised the introduction of the Premier League. And I go back to two comments made by two other people at that time. Jim McLean said it had been the end of the ball player. He was 100% right. And Archie McPherson says that's when coaches turned to fear. They would set up a defensive set up, ran, go and attack. He started to lose players like Willie Henderson, your Jinky Johnsons, 
and that's not in your Joe Harper's at, at strikers. All these players that could take a player on are disappearing. And I says, there's something going wrong here, what is it? So then I started to look at the 12 year old right through your leagues here, and I saw a pattern developing. And I says, your 12 year olds are doing the same thing as your professionals are doing. And what, what much coaching do you need today to play a long ball? Mm. Nothing. There's only two people that can get in the end of it. Well, do it. One the distributor and one the receiver at 60 yards away. And who's going to help him if the rest of them are coming out of box at a corner? But the Europeans were starting to introduce playing for the back. Just with John Gregg was starting to try and introduce. And what I saw against Cologne, that not when they were on the ball, they didn't really pick us up. They came for the back and everything was all practically short boys. And I says, this is the way Fipper seems to be going. That was great to watch it. Was this the start of tactics coming out of football? This was, well, the tactics were there in my day. Because I always said, if you go and look when I played at right back, especially against Hibs and against Celtic, Johnny Doyle and Arthur Duncan, two speed merchants, big joke says, man, Martin. That was it. it. Gives up the stand, you go away him. And that's a fact. I'd have swore that if Arthur Duncan and I, the amount of times I man marked him, went up the stand, he would have missed us. That's the way it was. Just how it he was, was cancelling me for overlapping, I was cancelling for getting down the, down the line. Johnny Doyle was the same. He says, for Christ's sake, he says that. But that day I was up against Johnny Doyle, getting one of them, which I against Celtic, but anyway, that, he was just, I was just up for that game that day. But that was the way it was. It was the same when we played Motherwell with a guy called Willie Pettigrew, prolific goal scorer. The first thing, and excuse my language, especially if anyone will listen to it, big joke would go like that to Big Tam. The minute he gets a boy Tam. Tam for safe? Aye. Fuck him. <laughs> Greggy, and he says, after Tam's fucked him, you fuck him. <laughs> and Pelly, when Greggy's feeding him, you fuck him, and then Tam it gets back to you. Who's Pelly? Who was that? Pelly, that's what they called me. Right? Aye, that, that was for, because when I first went there, I was shooting for the halfway line that, People said it was because I didn't have the ability. Well, I don't know. That, that, that's, that's argumental. But I did that. But when you saw my career through the amateurs and the juveniles, that's when I actually got my nickname. Right. It was shooting for me in half and scoring. Aye. That, things like that. So the, the name always stuck, but oh, as soon as I earned that halfway line, I was looking for a shot at goals. And that's why I got to be the fuck you or Pelly. And I always so remember Big Greggy, Big Greggy one night, oh it's funny, he says, Pelly says, see me hit Pettigrew, make sure you fucking put him up in the air and I'll volley him the way dude. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, <laughs> that, that, that was it. It was a different game then? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So you left Rangers, joined Hearts, and then how long were you at Hearts for? I think I was there for two seasons. And then, so after, I don't want to talk too much about Hearts, is it as the GST after all? That was it, that was it, that was it, the Rangers third team. <laughs> you know what I mean? Did you go into coaching then or what happened after? I went to Southern Albion part time and I got a horrendous injury in my first game. I went for a ball that was never mine. It was 80% in the favour of the guy that was volleying it. And I, if I hadn't stopped it, he was scoring. It was only really about the penalty spot and it was ideal, but it bounced just as that. So I lifted my leg up and as he volleyed through it, it twisted my ankle, my knee, and everything. And I was in Stirling Royal that night, at 11 o'clock at night, arguing with them. They were wanting to put a full length stucco on my leg. I says, you can't do that, because I started with British Gas on the Monday, and this was the Tuesday <laughs> night. And the manager of British Gas says to me, if the fit interferes with your job, you're out the door. So... It seems incredible. That's supposed to be more than that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. But of course, when the union... Or something. Uh, aye, when the union heard about that, they... Had this manager, they went to him and said, You can't do that. What if the guy get knocked down? But that was the way it was. Mm. So I had to phone up the guy that I was partnering. And he says, By the way, I'm knackered. He says, Right, we'll get, we'll get somebody else in with us. So we ended up with a three man crew. And I sat in the van. A supervisor came out. I jumped out in the van and held the, the pneumatic drill. <laughs> just to kid when I was, I was fit to do it. And the boys in the gas board were brilliant. They saw me through that six to ten week period. But was that the end of your football career? No, I, I managed to return to it. But, and I do apologise to Alex Smith and Stirling Albion, I let them down. There was a couple of occasions that you do a standby with British Gas, and that means you're on 24 hours. Aye. If a Call gas it. escape comes in, 
you've got to go to it. The guy that was supposed to relieve me on the Saturday broke his leg playing football on the Saturday morning. And I couldn't get to Sutherland Albion to get a game. And that happened twice. So at the end of the season, Alex Smith and I agreed that the best thing for me to do is right. to leave. So the gas board had a football team. And uh, by this time I was already coaching at uh, other levels. And we managed to get that sorted out. But my first coaching career was with a team called Irvin Vicks Juniors. And when they phoned me up, said, you like him doing top? I didn't know anything about them. So I drove into Irvin. Didn't know the way to get to it. And I came down this wee road. And then I saw this big pavilion with rugby parts and everything. Christ, there must be a few board down here. Mm -hmm. so I don't I, know about your meaning. Do you know where I am? Just the right hand side. Just after the Because the Vicks is running around the other corner. And I went like that. Oh, this shit looks great. Yeah, a boot. Went there and checked again. I'm like, too early, can't it be? So this guy was walking by. I said, excuse me, mate. I says, you any idea where Reverend Vicks Park is? Okay, son. Drive down the roundabout, get right around the roundabout and just got up the top of the road. Do you know when? Round the roundabout, looked up the top of this lane and here's this rusted, corrugated iron. And I went. Bert Loach was there. End up signing for them. And they were second boat in the league. And things weren't going right. But it wasn't for me to send about the wee manager. He was absolutely brilliant. I just got done, played, and that was it. But then they were, they were, they were going to sack him. And uh, they asked me to take her. And I says, no. And he says, why no? I says, I'm not going to stab him in the back. I says, I, I'm not like that. I says, if he's gone and resigns and the job becomes a vacant, I'll do that. But we're going to sack him. No when I'm here. I said, you can sack him if you like, but I'm not going to stab him in the back. I went home that night and phoned the wee guy. Mm. I says, I've offered me the job. Take it, Jim. I'm going back to Iceland. I didn't know if it was for Iceland. He says, thanks very much for phoning. He says, no, a lot of people would do that. He says... I'm just laughing because that's what you meant in the supermarket. Yeah, yeah. So, that's <laughs> not that. I don't know what I don't want to say that. Aye, aye, aye. I wish you did then. I got some messages to it. You know what I mean? So, and I went, took her, and... Uh, he says, right, we want you to take the, the club over. I says, right, but no interference for any of the committee. I date it my way. So I went home and I sat and sat and went through and through and says, how do I do this? So I looked at everything that I was already doing and I went, right, this is how we're going to do it. I'll get a squad of players together, give these boys a chance. If you get injured and you're out and the guy that comes in and takes your place, he remains. You're out the game. If you play a bad game, I'm not drop me. Everybody has a bad game. If you have two bad games, I'm starting to think about it. If you have three bad games, I'm going to arrest you. And if the guy comes in and plays well, you're out. And when I think I can play without losing a game, that's the way I'm going to do it. The two goalkeepers are the two best gate goalkeepers in Ayrshire. A guy called Arthur Sharp who went to Kilmarnock and a boy, David Gillespie. I says, I'll give you the Jackie Scarlet Cup. You'll play three games and you'll play three. I'll pick who I think's got the edge. Boy, if you Arthur Sharp go to it. And I'll play the other goalkeeper when I think we could win the game. And I put my hand in my heart. I'd never, ever, for all the clubs I've been with, I'd done ask for a transfer off any player. There you are. Now, I went into the committee that night and says, I'm taking your job. This is how we're going to do it. What other strips you got? I've got the blue, the red, and the tangerine and white. I says, let me see your tangerine and white. Ah, you're doing that because you're a Protestant and played with Rangers. I says, not at all. I says, I want to see it. So he brought it out. I says, how about change your colours to tangerine and white? He went, why is that? I says, there's a reason for it because it's going to make the players look physically and fitter better and I'll look fitter. I catch a load of crap. I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do you. You go and get a committee member and bring three players in that training park in here the same size, the same physique. Did that, and uh, brought them in, put the jerseys on them. I got them to stand like that. Tell me who looks physically bigger. Every one pointed to Tangerine and White. I says, let's change it to that. And I says, and you'll hear the reason for it when I bring the players in. So we brought them all in. I says, right, this is how it's going to be done. I'm going to train you at a very high professional level. 
and I mean it's going to be hard. I am going to coach you the way Ajax is coached in the Dutch international team, bit for bit. I says you will wear a shirt and tie on a Saturday. Turn up without a tie, I'm going to find you. So it's a shirt and tie. You'll be professional after part on a Saturday. You'll be professional on it. And to this day, I think my record still stands: sixteen games undefeated. Well, it's still. I mean, I, I, that, what, somebody told me that. Story? What was the reaction from the players at that point? Could it be Unbelievable. Something? Every player or every team I've been with and trained gave me a hundred percent. I even took it that amateur team anchor when I went back to coach them to the Renfrewshire Cup final. But someone went in the semi-finals and took Morton into extra time. And Ali McGraw, who's a great friend of mine, said that night, if he had the, the decision, he'd have gave us a cup. Because there was a wee accent, poor goalkeeper, one of their players, that we think was deliberately done. Ali came in and spoke to players. If it was my decision, I'd have gave you his cup. You played really well for an amateur team. Their words to these players oh, aye, yeah. were mere than receiving the cup. They players went out of there with their chest high. And that was the time a guy, Ali McGraw, is. Fantastic guy. Who was that, Alan? Alan McGraw played with Morton, striker. Oh, he was a manager. He was a supporter. Oh, aye, oh, 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 yeah. He's up, up in the house. I've been in touch big, with him. Big character in Scottish football. Absolutely. But you'll find all the big characters, all the, all the Rangers. But that, that was the way it was. And that was the way we trained. And I took that for Irvin Vix, De Vry, Troon, May Bowl, Christ May Bowl, the outer limits there, doing away, doing the borders. Um, I, can't, I think I mentioned Canvas Slang there in the, the amateur teams. So that was the way I done it. Jim, the main academy. So the final part of the interview, you people might wonder why we, we changed from the the Rangers side and we went on to the 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 amateur side of football. But the reason I was doing that was from leaving Rangers and playing your last game in Cologne and going to that side of football from Hearts and going in the amateur, you were a great thinker and you were analysing the game long before football analysts came about. Uh -huh. So, from Irvin Vicks, eventually he ended up at Real Madrid. Do you care to tell us what happened and how you right. got there? Real Madrid, I didn't go to Real Madrid. That, that was one of the it was, I was up in the Shetlands coaching and I came back to Paisley uh, and it was, I got a phone call to go and see, a phone call and a letter, can't I, I just can't mind, to contact this guy for Real Madrid at Glasgow Green. They, apparently they were there coaching. So I phoned up my son David and he went, no, they're there, they're there. So anyway. So you thought it was a wind-up? I, I did, aye, because I'd have played, I, that's kind of jokes I would play on Sunday. So anyway, we went up to Glasgow Green. We got introduced to the guy and he said, I says, can I walk about your training and see what it's like? So he says, aye, please do. So we did that, walked about, spoke great English. And then we came back up and I showed him the stats. The Pat Rice Arsenal was the very first guy to ever approach me on this stuff. But the Real Madrid boy goes like that. I says, that's the stats. We don't do that. I went, are you do? No, we don't. Watch the screen. So we had our, our screen up. So we put it on the screen. There you are. There it's again. And I just opened up my two books. There you are, look at that. Rangers, Celtic, Man United, Liverpool, things like that. Well, we do do it. Of course you do. But take a look at the numbers. Where are we up here? We might do that a hundred times in a game. These guys are only doing it ten. That's the difference in where the gaps were happening. So what kind of they stuff? They did it ten times. But, you know. So what kind of stuff was it? Worth? We covered goal kicks, free kicks, indirect free kicks, uh, did I say corners? Yeah. Everything. Yeah. The game starts with. What is the right back at a 12 year old doing in that position to a right back in the World Cup? What is it that we can't kind of connect with these guys. Now, you're not going to get a 12-year-old that will reach that stage. But what's to say that you can't reach two, three and four stages? So we looked at goalkeepers, right-backs, left-backs, what they're doing, how they play, how their formations are. And people always used to say, football changes every four years with the World Cup. Football changes on a daily basis. As soon as a manager changes one player and changes the formation, the game changes. 
But the basic rule of the game is possession will give you everything in the game. So, so you said that you know Real Madrid were doing something ten times, but we were doing it a hundred times. What what kind of thing? We couldn't pa- we couldn't make two passes. So that, that was the issue. It was that's the difference. difference. Scottish game You'll see that in my stats. If yeah. when you've got time, I could sit. We use a wee bit more. But obviously, you don't want to see it in the camera. I'll show you the stats that very few teams up here can make four and five passes consistently. Okay. As soon as we made one, and it went to two, it broke down. And it broke down because they just pumped the long ball forward or there was a tackle? Or there was nothing there. There was right. the, the, nobody worked in set pieces. So how did your advice go down with Real Madrid? Did they accept it? Absolutely. They took, took a couple of the catalogues with me. And went like that. Oh, God, we'll need to look at that. And it wasn't to later on in Spain that I was going to a wee place in Playa Flamenca I went up to this sports centre to take my stuff up because I was starting renting a wee villa over there and I'm saying I could maybe do some work up here and I went, oh. that extra 10 in a week <laughs> <laughs> oh, a percent is there likely how much was 10 or 10 percent is that, 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 that so somebody says why don't you go to the sports centre so I took the stuff up the guy was in the inn he says come back tomorrow we'll make an appointment for you I went back up and the, the other guy went like that and he says uh, I've got your card here Jim Denny spoke ve- very good English this guy I went aye you don't remember me and I'm getting back to 2004 maybe two, maybe even before that and this was only what, f- maybe eight, seven eight years ago I went aye so he mentioned his name I went alright you apply this aye well of course aye he says what has you got I says well I've docked it a wee bit more or increased it a wee bit how would you like to do a coaching session? I mean, when the night? Because they don't, obviously they don't train during the day. I said, what, no what problem. Was this no, this was uh, the Real Madrid. It was young boys. It was young boys at the, right. up at the sports centre. Right, okay. He said, yeah, I said, no problem. So up we went. Coached the young kids into things like that. You know, you're talking about kids between 10 and 14. And we went with it. And he went, that's pretty good. He says, that's a nice exercise, that one. And you'll see that in my book, Stoy Bucharest. Mm-hmm. my biggest mistake in coaching they invited me and a boy called Graham Smiley who actually works at Ibrox to go when we were coaching some Martin Reserves and used to at the time to go to Bucharest for two weeks and coach them and help with it, with it. and the manager at that time was a guy is it Petrie or Petrie or something like that um, you, you would need to look it up he was the guy who asked me he said we want to film your exercises and then they invited us to go there but we didn't go for simple reason, St. Martin Reserve and his team were gone for the league. And we felt that if we took that half, mm. the boys might have lost it. So we sacrificed that. But when the guy for the Almond saw it, they went like, can you speak Spanish? And I went, no. Go and learn it and we'll get you a job. I never did. Do you regret it? I and no. After getting the, the knees in, the, the hips replaced, no. So this, this is a question I was going to ask you. If you don't, we don't have to answer it all. We can move on and we can edit it out. Yeah. But so you you work with a lot of these teams. But you said you were a certain kind of reserve team coach. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever get any offers for manager managerial jobs, or did you ever apply for any? Or is that just assistant manager at Stranraer? Right. But did any other club like come in for you at any point, or is there any reason why? Was it... No, I never. I never really bothered to. to I wasn't the one that was going to put myself in the papers or that. I just went and did my job. Whatever I learned, I tried to learn these young boys. I tried to make these young boys a better player than what they are by showing them alternatives. And I'll give you an example. And I'm not going to mention this manager's name. This young boy was outside left. Was it the quickest? Beginning to have a flicking the ball up and try to put out the full back. That's where we want you. Do that and we'll just knock it by you. So he was given to me to the, into the youth team, but I was not to drop him. This young boy was to play no matter what went wrong. And for seven weeks, I kept telling this young boy before the games, and they're talking about reserve games as well, stop flicking the ball up. You're coming into a team, we play the ball in the deck. And when I say to you, I want you wide, I want your heels on the white, white line. No 10 yards in or 15 yards in, their fullbacks don't like coming out too far because then they're isolated when their centre-backs are in there. It leaves a gap for a midfield play to go. But if you do get the ball, and you can't beat the right back for pace, take him the inside. The two strikers I've got will just open up 
dry for the hole. If you take a shot and hit the corner flag, it's positive. If you score, brilliant. But if a centre back comes off, they come and take you on, and you try to dribble, and you lose the ball, get a row. Play the one two with your striker, it's free. Look for that. Visualise the space that you've got and see how it goes. Seven weeks later, the manager came in and said, hey, I'm taking the player off you. He's learning too many bad habits. And I went, what bad habits? He's still flicking the ball in the air and things like that. I says, I went and asked my assistant. He'll tell you, before the game, half time and after the game, I'm doing the same thing, but you've got me training it's five days a week. Surely you go to knock it out on there. He's got other bad habits. And I went, what's that? He's coming inside now. I don't like wingers coming inside. And I went, but surely, if he's not got the pace to beat a fullback, if you take a fullback on the inside, you're coming in his weaker side, then it commits a centre back. Because he's out of the game. You're talking shite. Well, that, went, that's one of the reasons why I was asking that last question. Because it seems to me as if you've done a lot for the game. Seems to me as if you've got ten, almost ten years yeah. at Rangers. You know, eight, eight, nine, nine years. Anyway, say nine. Right, and the and the squad of the Cup Winners Cup played a lot of games. Then you wanted the coaching, but a lot of that. It seems to me as if you've never got the full rewards that you maybe deserve. Is that something? Do you, do you feel that way? No, nah, not really. No, no. There are people uh, in in the game that does the same. But I mean, as I said, get back to that guy before I jump on. He went, "You're talking shit." Mm. He says, "What winger comes inside?" And I went, "Do you know, Ripley." McManaman, Giggs, he's not as good as him. I said, do you know I get that said to me at Inverclyde by one of the coaches down there, that that guy might not be able to do that. I says, but is that no our job as a coach? Is to coach that young boy as an alternative? Because the first alternative's not working. And he's got nothing else. He's well take him off the park. And that was it. So Jim, you studied the game and you became very good at studying... Well, I wouldn't say that good at Well, Because, I mean... Anybody that studies a game will have an opinion. You can show an incident in a game to 10 different people and you'll have 10 different opinions. That's what makes football a great game. Yeah, I understand that. But, but the only thing is, I've got the stats that will back me up. So the point I was going to make is, you studied it to an extent that you had the stats to show people. Real Madrid coaches at some levels took it very seriously, but Scottish football at the time, they didn't they? Was that, would that be correct to say that? In Scottish football... And, it, and it's a shame, I'm not going to criticise today's coaches, but there's something in Scottish football, and more so in Verclyde than I, I, I don't like picking away at it, because I failed my licence, but, and I, and I don't regret it. It's probably one of the best things that happened to me, because it saved any pressure. But we didn't endorse things. It was their way, or their way. If you spoke to Herrera, the Italian manager, and says to him about this, he would say, if it gets the ball in the same area, we endorse it. Football can only move on if we endorse it. And I can go down in a public park, I'm doing to watch a wee game at like that or somebody training. I can guarantee I would pick an idea. You endorse that idea. You don't say, oh, no, I'm not doing that for my boys. You do it. And maybe if it's not right, you work on it. Now, if you look at coaches, and I, t I take it at a lower level, not so much at the big level, but the lower level, Right, we're going to do this and we're going to do that tonight. We're going to do a, a move. Out of 10 passes, five of them break down. And after 15, 20 minutes, I'll just leave it, we're going to something else. You have wasted that 15, 20 minutes by increasing his passing sequence from five to maybe eight, nine or ten. Then you've got the confidence that they're making this pass. We can work in things like that. Because you've got to work on set pieces or you're going to give possession away. And it's not about putting all these players into the box. Watch the next time a free kick's getting put into a box or a corner. I'll guarantee on average there are 14 players between the penalty spot and the goal line. That's a hit and hope. Yep, so right now if you watch uh, Cubs full circle back to Rangers, one of the kind of bugbears I've got right now is that when, when we have a corner, so no, sorry, when, when the uh, other team in opposition has a corner, we've got every single player either in the box or just outside the box. Do you, do you agree with that? Or? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't hump the ball back up the park. So because it'll come straight back in you before you're yeah. out the, out the box. That, 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 well, that seems to be what happens at Rangers quite a lot, where they clear it and then they well, just clear it anywhere. Let, let's, let, let's, let's look at a corner. You bring your striker back. You've got 11 players against 9 outfield players. If you can't 
stop them scoring, there's a problem. So I'll send my striker back up the park. Do you think a centre half's going to be comfortable just on his own? Has he got the confidence? Because we had the confidence to do it in our day. We went man for man mm -hmm. with Joe Harpers and, and things like that. I mean, I remember Big Ronnie at the Easter Road. You were right with him. I'll go up for the corner, and I on you go. And I can see a big joke shining his on the dugout. That I'm standing here man for man with Harper. But we had the confidence, but I had the yeah. pace and all that to, to get us out of it. So I'll send the striker up. I am guarantees two players going to come back and mark him. Yeah, so we'll so we've back. still got an extra man in the box. Yeah, so as as is what I not ask question. So last week, uh, when we were you know we scored against Liverpool and they got the corner and Firmino scored the equaliser, we had our right back Tavernier and Sakala going for that ball with Firmino. Now he's their main striker and Sakala is our striker. Or our right, right then you've got to ask the defenders what he's doing. Now, when a ball gets played into a, into a box for a corner, it'll take about 1 or 1.2 seconds for that flag to get there right that's, that's what will be even if you want to say between 1 and 2 seconds just to yeah. take it up now in our day we waddle go and get it and that meant if you Gordon were in front of me I should have the ability to know how high you can jump I'll come and take it I'll shout Gordon leave it that means that yeah. you're dug it. But when I'm shouting, Gordon, leave it, I'm telling you, I'm distracting the striker because he thinks he's going to get hit by another player. True. And yeah. that is when we do it. We don't stand with him and let the ball come in. If I can get that ball there, I'm going to go and get it. And that's what made Big McKinnon and Big Bomber and all the rest of the, the boys in the team go and meet the ball. If you go to get through your eight man, we'll repair them. That was a fact. There was, was a big period telling you. But, but there'll be no doubts, right, that in the days after the other cat things like that, the way the game's shaped up, that Rangers will have analysis, professional analysis, and analysing the game. Oh, absolutely. So what, what would they focus on regarding... I mean, it's all right when you watch a game, you shout... So How things. players play. From the Liverpool game, and the Rangers support are not very angry after it all, clearly. But they would be. What what would you say would they, they would focus on analysis? Would it be there? The players there? running after the ball and where they play. That, that's what that's what you'd be looking for. But we, when things like that, when you lose, lose seven goals like that, now, a coach can only do so much. He'll tell the player what he can do. I, I watch some coaches now at the sideline before the sub goes on, and I'm saying, I'm saying it's like an encyclopedia. Yeah. Too much information. The guys, if I always, I always said in, in, in my coaching that I might be wrong and if you're having a bad time and you change it and you work, come out and tap I'm not going to criticise you I'm going to commend you that you should have the ability to know what you can do to stop him playing even if though I've gave you tactics to do the game you should have the ability to say it's not working for me so, a lot, so you, would, you would say that a lot of the the, the, Always did a it. lot of people blame the manager after the game is what I'm meaning it's easy to blame a manager so, so the, a lot more uh, criticism should be on, on the players absolutely I mean at, at the end of the day it's the players that's on the park if things are not going right you change it for yourself that's where Big Greg and all that and that we, we come in if things were right there was a guy that used to play with Morton a boy called his nickname is Sugar Sugar Roberts a striker he came out like Steeny sleeves rolled up he would run everywhere you run the ball and pass it, he'd hit you anyway just to let him know he's still there. And when Big Bob and I played against him, Big Joke says, who's picking him up? Bob and I looked at one and I went, he better in the other place. We'll just pass him on. But that's how good Rangers players were. The likes of Sandy Jarrett, internationals. And, you know, he jump away from some stuff like that as well. When I hear players saying, oh, they're tired now and things like that, your Sandy Jardins, your Danny McGrain's, your John Gregg's and all that, they were played an international midweek and then turned up on Saturday to play a game. And I'll even they, they get the bus home. Basically. Uh, that, well, hi, well, <laughs> no, I know Greggy, no, but a taxi for Greggy, don't be bloody daft. <laughs> you know, chauffeur driven. But that was the way the, the, the Jardins that played. They never complained, they just got out and done the job. And I remember Rangers Reserves played five games in one week. Now, I don't care what anybody says, see the Reserve League in that day you would guarantee you that Rangers, Celtic, Hibs, Aberdeen and possibly Dundee United could probably finish in the top four in that Premier League in this day. That's how good these some of these reserve sides was. And we went, we played five games in one week. Two, by the way, two 
on the same day, a Friday, because the season was finished on the Saturday and Waddle wanted it cleared. So he sent a squad of us, 14 of us, up on a bus. And we played two games against Aberdeen, one at three o'clock and one at half seven that night. And I'll give the Aberdeen staff their due. They helped us out. And get back to the eight days, when you seen the park at Aberdeen and Easter Road, you did well if you could find grass. It was brick hard, mud. Brick hard mud. And that's what you played on. So you can imagine what your feet were like. But the Aberdeen staff were brilliant. They come in, gave us wee rubs at half, uh, before the next game and that to help us out. And we played two games in the same day. Many players could do that now. They've known about it. Do you think players have too much power these days compared to... Oh, no. I think they've got a bigger say. Well, I mean, you look at... Uh, my case with my, the, the transfer. Well, that's what I was like. I get slaughtered. Yeah. Yeah. But you look at players now, as soon as the agents got them in, he's away trying to sell them again. No. But the fans today are different for the fans in my day. Well, I, no, I, yes and no. Like, in my own personal point, there's people that I sit beside the Ibrox, especially my, my dad sits beside as well, but they, I won't mention any particular player, but they, they criticise the one player over and over again. He, Absolutely. He, he could be having the best game ever. Correct. But he's, he still gets slaughtered. I'll, so. show you, I'll show you something in, in this phone, and then you can, as I say, I'll love an interview. But you're 100% right. But do, the, do, you think, do you have any reason why that could be? Is it just, you just, bad, is it just bad luck? Well, I'm going... <laughs> No, it, it's, it, you, you can't criticise fans, right? That's one thing. They are allowed to criticise. They pay, they pay your wages. End of story. They're allowed to criticise any day. But nobody, no player puts a jersey on to go out and play bad. Yeah. They need encouragement. But the minute you're on their backs, I don't care what anybody says, it'll affect the best player in the world. It does. The best thing to do encourage the player he's not out there deliberately playing bad and that is the way it goes and I remember a player and by the way I could have made a fortune to this guy because nobody would take my bet on I'm not going to mention this player's name by the way he came off he's that night at the park kissing his jersey and they're all going look at that big man look at that that's fantastic I went what a load of shite I says, he'll be away just shortly. Aye, that'll be right. I says, there you go. There are five on the bar. I, I mean, I'm a teetotaler. I was watching a Rangers game in Huey Clark's pub. He was a right blue nose and all. And uh, I says, there are five. I'll give you all 41. They were eight of them. Aye, that'll be right. I says, well, there you go then. You're backing up. Six weeks later, he was gone. I went, I walked in. I went, ah, oh, there you go, eh? Kiss the jersey. He was kissing your, he was kissing your ass, boys. He made a bloody fortune. He's away to play with a bigger... No, I'm not saying a bigger club. No, that wouldn't be right. He's away for a few bob mayor. That's what you're kissing your jerseys all about. You go back in my day with they boys. Your Graham Fives, your Alec Millers, it was all fringe players. Who, they stuck with it. Who is the best player you ever played against? Every one of them. Every player you played against. Didn't matter whether he played with Stenhouse Muir. I was going to say Third Lanham, but they were gone by that time. As <laughs> um, soon as a player... He's got a professional tag, whether he's part-time, full-time, or no. He's a professional, and he gets that respect. Even though you're in your junior leagues, and your amateur leagues, no matter what player level he plays at, give the guy respect. Because I always remember an old guy in Paisley. I used to meet this old guy. He had a wee Airedale dog, if you remember these wee things. And he was always talking about this, that I was the best under-21 player that he'd ever seen. I never men mentioned my professional career once. Oh, yeah. He wouldn't believe it. Yeah. And he's, the, the only thing that worried him was his wee dog. He says, I hope that goes before me. And I mean, why is that? He says, I'd hate to leave it. He says, ah, but even though it still goes before you, these wee dogs are with you for the rest of your life. And he went, how's that? I don't know if you two boys remember them. There were toys made for Airedale dogs. He says, they'll stick two bulls in its eyes. I'll put four wee wheels in its feet and a wee handlebar in its arse and you can push it about. Believe it or not, they used to sell wee dogs like that as toys for kids Aye. years and years ago. And that's what it was. It was a wee Airedale dog and he always said that was the best thing that ever happened. Aye. I, never, I mean, I always saw him for a while after that, but the poor bugger passed away. So, so just to finish up, it's getting a bit late. Um, 
You were telling me and Gordon earlier on before the interview some impressive stuff that you'd found in football facts uh -huh. from your analysis. And that, do you care to share some of them with us? Things like how long the balls will play. Right, goalkeeper. Uh, well, let's say uh, goal kicks. I'll ask you a question in the goal kick. Goalkeeper kicks it into the opposition's half. How long do you think a team could keep possession for? Ah, put you in the spot, innit? Uh, 30 seconds. So, 30 so, seconds. So, after, so the, the defender wins the header and it goes to the old defender. From a kick yeah. out. Well, you go and tell me then, how long do you think you can keep possession for? <laughs> what should Rangers do? It takes about six seconds, but. Uh, Money, I, you're nowhere near it. I think they should be able to keep possession for a good while, but I don't think they do. For a ball getting kicked by a goalkeeper, and I'm going back to my time and the ball was a wee bit heavier, it might be a, quick, a lot quicker now. It took four seconds to reach the opposition's half. Right. But for three and tenths of a second, oh. the ball's up there. Yeah. It only takes a minute of a second for the goalkeeper to touch it and kick it in the centre half to hit it back. Why are you getting yourself counter-attacked within four seconds of your own set piece? Well, that's but it's in your own half, it's three seconds. Well, that's what frustrates me, again, right back at Rangers, is that I noticed that, I noticed that most weeks, but specifically against Dundee United a few weeks ago, when we were in 2-1, injury time, we've got a corner kick, and within 10 seconds, they've got a corner kick, and they nearly, they nearly score from it, and it, it frustrates the hell out of me, so how would you, how, how do you counter that? By setting up your own set piece or don't take the corner. Keep it in the corner. You've got to kill you've got to kill time, you've got to respect the opposition. So what you want to do is keep possession. Don't don't give them the ball. Even if you've got to send it on the way back to your goalkeeper, don't give them the ball. Because they can hurt you with a bit of luck. You know, people always say, oh we should beat them eight nine or six nine or four nine or whatever it is. Minnows will always get a bite at the bait. And that's all they need. It's for that bite to get there. And I'll give you Stradra Challenge Cup. Now, we're a part-time team. And Campbell Money and I took Stradra Fipper Club to the Challenge Cup final against St Johnson. With one shot, deflected. And we won one nothing. We spent the rest of the game, the guys defending it. And football, that's all it needs something. That's all it needs. So why give it away? Throw-ins. Now, you can have your throw-ins in a hundred... 80 degrees if you like or whatever you want to do it. But throwings can only be thrown in, really thrown in four directions. Down the wing, striker, midfield, or back the way. And when you look at the stats that I've got, what way would you say you keep possession there? In the middle. No, I would say put it to the back. You're 100% right. Look at your European teams. They get it back as quick as they can and they build it to the back to draw yeah. you out. Because football's like a game of chess now. Yeah, going back to Rangers, yeah. they, they usually give the ball away at three at throw ins because the, everyone's shouting, get it up, get it forward, get it forward. Well, if you're away back in your own, you know, say maybe 15, 20 yards for your area, then I can see where you're trying to make distance because it would be very risky unless you've got a set play that'll get you out of that. And I'll give you an example when I did a, a thing for. Uh, who was it? Was it Partick Thistle? It was Partick Thistle against somebody. And I was analysing the game uh, for their manager. And Big Boyd was up. I think it was, was it Kamara. It might have been Kamara. The Big Boyd up front. Boyd came back to the... It was up there at the Partick stand. He came back and he was about 20 yards for the corner flag to, to throw in. And they lost the ball. And they almost scored for it. And I always say that when you get a set piece, you need to get yourself out there. Why bring boy the other way back? Mm -hmm. Leave him up in his own half and have another guy on the far side. And when I was at the Barton, I was the assistant over there, we beat Wickham Wanderers 3 2 in a pre season friendly. And it was, is it Sanchez you called the guy? Was it something like that? It was a manager. Laurie Sanchez. Laurie Sanchez. He said that was the first time I'd ever been beat with three set pieces mm. and it was a throw in. And all it was was thrown at the striker's feet in my own half, laid back, and just humped 
with the left back to the other side of the park as hard as he could. My right back would be level with the throw on the far side and my winger was up the park. So if he hooked his pass, the right back got it. If he sliced it, the winger got it. We scored three times for a throw in. Now, that's not to say that's going to happen all the time. It's the exact same with free kicks. You need to work it out. Do something. And there's set pieces on these papers that I've got through there. And surveys and everything that I could think of. That if you had more time if you want, you can always come back some time. Ten scenarios. And so, so have a look us, and I'll, so, I'll lay it out for you. I'll show you. We'll, we'll do that. So tell us another few facts. You were telling us about how, how long a game of football lasts. People judge a game by two halves, 45 each way. I judge a game in the amount of set pieces there is a game. So if you've got, to, just to simplify it, 100 set pieces, people say, ah, that'll be right. Go and look at the game. And you'll find that it's between 50 to 100. You, you're going to throw-ins in this. Yeah, every, every set piece you've talked talk about, goal kicks, throw-ins, bounce-ups if you like, free kicks and all that, count the many that are in a game. And you'll find that Let's just well, even if you think hundreds too much, but I'll show you some facts where Not can believe there it. is a, there is over a hundred set pieces. It's a hundred small sided games because the game stops yeah. to restart, stops to restart, and that's how it goes. Does it just start with kick off? It starts with that, and that's that's how we analyse the game. So the average game just now that we watch in a professional level lasts ninety minutes. Would you agree with that? No. The time's 90 minutes, but it goes on further. But if you actually got a referee to actually do the game, Christ, you'd be playing extra time. So how much actual football's played in 90 minutes? I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you two games, right? But I'm not going to tell you the professional one, <laughs> in case it's come back at me. But I can, I'll find the facts for you next time you come back. So is this, is well, let's is go into... Eh? These are facts you're giving as well? This is facts. Yeah. Everyone's facts. Well, let's go in Tayport, Junior Cup final. There was a hundred and thirty. There was a hundred and forty odd set pieces. It's incredible, us. And there was two teams in Scottish football out with the old firm, who practically had the same. And when we gave them a time for the amount of time to get the ball and collect the ball, and took that away for ninety minutes, none of the two games lasted any more than. 38 minutes. That's how long the ball's in play for? Like, on the park? On the park, that ball was in play for 38 minutes. Would that be the scenario for most games of football then, though? You look at a game and you'll see. But I still watch one and you'll be quite surprised. Well, when, team, when, when teams come to Ibrox, I mean, I'd, love, I'd love to go back and check this because last season, it felt last, I think we drew it at home against Motherwell in the second half. I don't think the ball was in play at all because Motherwell just every opportunity the player went down or they hit it out of the park so looking back on that you might find some of the stats in that, that book there that I gave you honestly looking back but there's more game, stuff through there that it was no no I won each and uh, I swear that the ball was just seemed hard to hard like we had play so I can believe that in some games I oh watch. absolutely absolutely I mean it's, it's absolutely frightening but that's the way it goes but the game lacks character now there's no characters in the game which is sad I never see it yeah. Whereas in our day you had Steeny, you had Tam Gemmel, you had Wee Henderson, where the chit chat in the game was always always going on. I mean, th that, that was it. And you mentioned the fact that the referees were part of that part of it as but well. The referees were brilliant. You could shout and ball at a referee, don't no swear on. You could shout and ball, but you gave the, you still gave them respect because of a chat with them. Mm -hmm. And as I said, with Steeny that day, you're having a bloody nightmare. And I'll see many stars. You get in the mail tomorrow. Steeny just, so, what? So in terms of the, the VAR that's coming into football next week in Scottish football... Um, Hate it. You're, you're against it completely? I'm totally. It's killing the game. Game stops for him to go and have a look at it. So that's more time again. Where's it? You're killing the opinion of the game. Because they're going to show it in TV and you went, oh, that's a penalty. Oh, have you seen some of the decisions in the last couple of weeks? Absolutely. Who the hell's making them? Who uh, are these guys? Well, as I've always said, that you can bring in what you like, but there's still that... There's still the person watching it that makes the call. That's what I'm going to ask you, but who are the guys? Who is it going I have to be? no idea. So that's another referee. Ah, but the th but the, I mean, the, the, the thing is, what does a referee that are getting taught now know about a tackle? And our, gay, our day, our boys get tackled for the back. They were coming through to get the ball. 
Play one. It's a good tackle. You go at the ball, but you go at you first. No, you can't tackle for the back. And I see some of the tackles, some of the guys there, and they're going, that's a free kick. He's getting sent off. And you're going, what for? That was not for us in day. As I say, I get back to Big Greggy. Make sure when you fucking put him up there and I'll volley him the way down. <laughs> and that was, that was it. Aye. You know what I mean? And if you're lying here with an injury, Steve would come up, what's up with you? Tight's torn. And that was it. That was it. And as I say, big joke in the treatment table. Man and a poof, that was enough to get you off the table. You're lying so there waiting and getting all your injections. I mean, you know? the, the game's certainly changed now, as you see, you're looking oh. on the, the VAR. Um, I mean, it's money. That's what it is. It's the money makers. That's what it is. It's keeping your big clubs. Do you still do football analysis? You still? No, I gave it up. I gave it up. Because nobody wanted it to finish up. I knew it's a big, I mean, it's a massive thing on Sky TV. I can't compete with them. Can't compete. But I mean, I'm getting way back. And people are getting better at it. Who was doing it when you were, see when you were doing this stuff, was there anybody else? No, I know. Or questioning it or anything? I have no idea. No idea. But as it's I said... It's you never got involved with this kind of sky. Because it may be champagne, me and Gordon are drinking and drinking no, coffee. I, I, I've, I've had my day, I've had my day, I, I champagne, I, that big of you. Uh, you know, what a glass of water, not a problem. Um, no, I, I wasn't the one for wanting to be it. I'd rather, if I was going to do any stats, I'd be in the background. Yeah. That's where I would rather be. I don't want to be up there saying, well, that guy does this, that guy does that. That to me leaves you open. And when I listen to some of the commentators, I look at the same point they're making. And I've got a different opinion for them. And I respect their opinion. But uh, when I hear them criticising managers and things like that, though they might have a right to criticise a manager, first question I'll say to them, have you ever done the dugout yourself? A different kettle of fish. Uh, the dugout. An, an ex-player that played with Rangers, I won't name him uh, for the season, but um, I know you know quite well, He's, we were talking about the games in the last couple of weeks and he said to me that the problem Rangers defence have is Barisic and Tavernier are great attacking defenders but they're very poor defending defenders. What can I see when you see like football analysis what would you be able to take out of the way they play? I'd play them forward. And I'd have any play them there. The, I mean, if you, if you look at the most successful teams in British, I'm not saying British history, but over the last maybe 20 or 30 years, you're Man United and your Arsenal, big clubs. And I, I'm looking at the English player, I'm not, I'm not looking up here, but I'm looking at Rangers as well. I'll take you back to my time. They had four defenders. A right back, two centre backs, and a left back, and a goalkeeper. Your job, if nobody scores, I don't need to say anything. Your job's done. Don't let the opposition score. That's where the success was with Man United, and Arsenal, Rangers, and Celtic. A solid back four, and a goalkeeper. Then the rest in front could go and take the risk and hit the box. And when you real, realistically think about it, if you play a 4-4-2 system, all one of the midfield players need to do in 90 minutes is get into the box four times in 90 minutes. That sounds astounding, doesn't it? And why do you say now, that? Sorry, I haven't right, that. I, I know I've thrown you a wee bit. Four times is one midfield player needs to hit the box in 90 minutes. Multiply it before. You've got 16 times a, a, another player gets into the box. And that causes mayhem. That's all it takes. Four times for one midfield player. And a player like Tavernier, do you think that would suit his game? I, I, I would play him forward. Cause you, I mean, if, if, if I was coming up against the likes of Tavernier, I'd be like any manager. I'd just say to my wingers, just stay there. If we get the ball, we'll get it to you right away. And then move on the striker to the other side of the park that'll take the two centre-backs out of the road. And get back to the boy Hutton that played with Rangers at right back, remember? Alan Hutton. Yeah. Alan, Hutton. Yeah. Alan was the same. I'd have played him forward. And I get back to a game at Irox with Leon. And Leon, Leon beat, beat Rangers 3-0 that night. We, we won 3-0 away and they won 3-0 at Ibrox. Boom song's last game. And where did their goals come from? I think two of them came from where Alan Hutton should have been. No, I don't blame Alan Hutton. Because he went out of the park and I think Leon went like that. Don't come back with him. We get so the bubble gate looking back to one of the games, you made a good point earlier on in the conversation about uh, the winners hugging the, hugging the white line because full backs don't like getting drawn out there. Absolutely. One of the criticisms that Bonner and Barris has just come in for, well, not a criticism, but he's been exposed a couple of times because do you think now teams playing against Rangers are having their winners playing 
extreme right and extreme left to drag Tavernier and Barisic out. Right, but the, the, the thing about play, playing like that, when, you, when you've got a winger that goes right out, there's only, one them could, there's only one person on the ball, or could go on the ball at any time. Now, if the ball's doing Tavernier's side, the furthest man away from him, or the furthest man from him, the, the opposition, he's the least danger. Because you're watching for him. So your full back will come in and your other defenders will move across to support one another. As soon as that ball's switched, then your back four starts moving across again. And as I say, football's like a game of chess now. And it, it probably was a new day as well. The players are the pieces. It's the managers that are the players. They will move a player to gain a, a move or something like that, a game advantage. Or they'll move a player to disadvantage your position. That's the way it's done. Standard. So it simplifies it. We said we're going to come into a half an hour interview with you, Jim. We've done an hour and 45. Oh, two hours. That's all right, and you've ate all my bloody biscuits. I've ate all your biscuits. But listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. No, it, was my privilege. it was my privilege. Yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating. Yeah. As I said, you are welcome to come back and I'll get some stuff laid out for you and I'll show you some stuff that might shock you on your set pieces. I'd love we'll to maybe do that, do that separately, aye. Um, I'll, show, I'll, show, I'll show you the survey that we'd actually... We give to the players and the coaches to fill in. I'd love to talk about some in particular Rangers games and then have you explain to us what's went right or what's went wrong. Because you better hope I've seen the game first. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he doesn't drink. You need to drink watching Rangers. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 I, mean, no. I mean, I mean games that have. Uh, I mean games and that we've already played. You, talk, you talk about the drink. I could tell a good laugh. Huh? I remember it was wee bud, wee, wee, wee bud funny. It's when he get his wee bit gone. We went to Barcelona years ago when it was Wally Smith. We got sent down the gangway to sit in the room before you could do on the plane, but the Rangers players had to go in. And one of them came down in the, the swagger with the earphones in. And I looked at the players, it was like us, and I could see the envy or the resentment in the face. And wee bud goes like that. Look at them. Look at the swagger they've got. He says, they've won nothing. He says, do they have mute on the plane? It was a carry out. I mean, you know, I mean, that was it. I mean, you know, right. and of course, when you see what we bud broke that that time, you know, honestly, it about twenty years. Aye. All right. You you can you could not believe what bud broke back. Yeah, he went to a shop to buy tobacco and God knows what for the people, and the woman had to give him two big leather hold dogs, plus a smaller one, a medium sized one, totally full. Yeah, even she even had to send her daughter with bud to the bank. To get me our money, he hadn't enough money with him. Then we went to took it back to the hotel. It was having me me Bud and Steenie. Then we went to this big store, and you could not believe that we had to take three of the trolleys <laughs> back to the hotel, buy all these range of supporters that were all sitting. And of course, in Spain, as you as you know, some of the slabs of goat get wee dimples on them, and all you could hear was a trolley going clink, 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 clink. They're all going like that. Well, things have to change with that lot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's some guy we bud right off, you know. But fantastic. Well, as you see, Jim, football's a different game nowadays. Oh, absolutely. But I wish we'd bear time. I, I, well, as I say, we'll come back. We'll, we'll come back. We'll do another. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're yeah. welcome. to come back anytime. Uh, yeah, as I say, nice. it's my privilege. So, um, you know, the fans deserve a wee bit back for us. You know, so fantastic. Um, Thank you very much. No, you're welcome.